Welcome everybody uh, to this afternoon's event entitled A Zippier Economy Lessons from the 1992 Hilma Competition Reforms with Andrew Lee, the Assistant Minister for Competition, Charities and Treasury. My name is Kirsten Andrews and I'm the Vice President External Engagement at the University of Sydney. Thank you for joining us in the room and to those of you who are online as well. Welcome all. Before we continue with the formalities, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, water and culture. Today, we're here on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to those elders past and present. At the University of Sydney, we're deeply honoured by the opportunity to continue teaching and learning on the lands on which the Gadigal people have been teaching and learning on these lands for many hundreds, um, hundreds of years, thousands of years. Um, so I further acknowledge the traditional custodians of the country on which you're on today, wherever you may be watching from, where you live, work and share ideas as we remember to continue that tradition. I'm thrilled to welcome Andrew Lee, my former colleague and friend, the Assistant Minister for Competition, Charities and Treasury, to speak with us today. Not only is Andrew a great friend of the university and, might I say, the university sector on the whole, he's, a, he, he's spoken out many times about the contribution that higher education makes to the national interest and we're grateful. He's also a proud alum, having graduated with first class honours in arts law. An additional fact I've just learned is that Andrew is the child of two former university professors. So there are many, many connections here. Prior to being elected uh, to his current role in 2010, Andrew was a Professor of Economics at the Australian National University and he holds a PhD in Public Policy from Harvard University. He also hosts a podcast called The Good Life, The Andrew Lee, and Andrew Lee in Conversation, all about living a happier, healthier and more ethical life. And those of you who've seen Andrew's many writings and, um, and um, contributions to public life will know that he's always been an advocate of good evidence, looking at the facts and using that to make our lives better. And I'm looking forward to hearing what his views are about how we might do that in his current role today. Today he's going to share why he believes that competition policy is fundamental to economic dynamism and rising living standards. Then after the talk I'll join Andrew in conversation, which will include some of the questions sent through in advance and I thank those people who've taken the trouble to do that. I'd now like you to ask and join me in welcoming Andrew Lee. Well, thanks so much, Kirsten, for a really generous introduction. It is a real pleasure to be here, hosted by you. Uh, people should also realise uh, how extraordinary it is that Kirsten is not only here, but vertical, having got off plane from Canada just this morning. Uh, so when I'm talking about a zippier economy, uh, Kirsten is personifying zip and pep in her presence here today. Uh, can I too acknowledge the Gaggle people, traditional elders of the land we're meeting today, uh, pay my acknowledgement to Elders past and present and to any Indigenous people present here today. I'd like to thank Sydney Ideas, the University of Sydney's flagship public talks program. Uh, welcome students, faculty, staff, members of the broader community uh, for uh, coming along today. Uh, having spent six years at Sydney University, having uh, edited uh, Oni Swa for a year, uh, it is really good to be back. Uh, and given the topic of today's presentation, lessons from the 1993 Hilma Review and the subsequent national competition policy reforms, it is a real pleasure to acknowledge Professor Fred Hilma, who's joined us here today. Uh, it, it's really exciting and really daunting to have you here in the audience, Fred, so thank you. Uh, as Professor Hilma told me recently, the national competition policy reforms were big, bold, and far-reaching. He's right in every respect. They're regarded as among the most significant economic reforms in Australian history. And we're still, that we're still talking about them some 30 years later reflects what they did to produce a zippier economy a generation ago. Successful reform often looks deceptively easy afterwards. This one took some years to unfold, roughly 1992 to 2005. It took cooperation across state, territory and federal level, substantial financial incentives and countless meetings, none of them on Zoom. And the reforms didn't receive universal support at the time. That they succeeded is a credit to Fred Hilmer and to the reforms architects. Above all, it took a big idea, 
Competition was the key to ensuring that economic reform delivered for regular Australians. In his book Afterwards, Paul Keating wrote, we brought a new word to the Labor lexicon, competition. Competition is our word, not their word, not the Tories' word. Paul Keating said, we were tired of paying twice as much as we should be paying for cars, for telephones, for clothing, for electricity. By cutting tariffs and by lifting domestic competition, we created a low price structure, thereby allowing people's wages to go further. Keating wasn't the first great Labor leader to appreciate the power of competition. Labor Attorney General Lionel Murphy had introduced the 1974 Trade Practices Act, ending decades of businesses lawfully colluding at the expense of Australian consumers. Keating knew it fell to Labor again to raise the whole notion of competition. National competition policy was how he sought to deliver for Australian households. The objective, better prices, allowing people's wages to go further. It wasn't just ordinary workers paying too much. Keating also believed businesses were paying too much for their inputs, particularly services. The economic reforms of the 1980s, floating the dollar, financial deregulation and reducing tariffs exposed many sectors to international competition for the first time, promoting growth and efficiency. But this highlighted that many areas of the domestic economy faced minimal, if any, competitive pressure. Sectors such as transport, electricity, water and telecommunications were re still relatively untouched by competitive forces. For a country striving for a seamless national economy, it made little sense that competition rules didn't apply to professional services, government businesses or agricultural marketing. There was a recognition that if Australia's domestic economy wasn't competitive, then the country would struggle to compete internationally. 30 years ago this month, the press release announcing an independent inquiry into competition policy in Australia hit fax machines across the country. Keating turned to business leader and academic Fred Hilmer, along with Jeff Taprell, a senior lawyer, and businessman Mark Rayner. The Hilmer inquiry would spark the national competition policy reforms. A generation on, my talk aims to answer three questions. What did Hilmer do? How did it affect the economy? And what can competition reformers learn from it today? Let me start by giving a sense of the timeline, the institutions involved, and where the momentum came from. By the early 1990s, work was already underway to improve domestic competitiveness. Australia started to see government business enterprises operate more efficiently, exposed to competition, or in some cases privatised. We started to see reform or removal of inefficient regulations in agriculture, aviation, electricity, finance and transport. For example, the two airlines policy ended in 1990. This policy had, for decades, restricted domestic aviation to the publicly owned Trans Australia Airlines and its private sector competitor, ANSET. Subsequently, open skies prevailed. In general, that's been a good thing for flyers. Sure, airline competition did mean that we got Tiger Air Australia, but airline competition also meant we pretty soon no longer had Tiger Air Australia. To switch from air metaphors to ocean metaphors, the tides may have been turning slowly, but there were big waves of reform on the horizon. In July 1991, the Prime Minister, Premiers and Chief Ministers agreed that a national approach to competition policy would be important. A couple of months after the Barcelona Olympics, Keating formally announced the Review into National Competition Policy in October 1992. With almost the energy of Olympian Kieran Perkins in the pool or Cathy Watt in the velodrome, 
Professor Helmer and his team got to work. They were reported back to government in a matter of months, by August 1993. And their proposals represented a comprehensive, coherent and detailed program of microeconomic reform. Albeit one that political commentator Kerry O'Brien said might cause a journalist's eyes to glaze over. And given Kerry O'Brien's interest in programmatic specificity, that's really saying something. O'Brien later observed that the ambitious recommendations were riddled with political implications but Keating was in the thick of it. The fact that Keating met on multiple occasions with Professor Hilmer speaks to the high priority that the Prime Minister placed on competition reform. By April 1995, the Council of Australian Governments had agreed to implement Australia's first national competition policy, which broadly reflected the reforms Professor Hilmer had proposed. It was time for action. Around 1,800 laws and regulations that restricted competition were reviewed and, where appropriate, reformed. Capturing the scale of the impact is hard today because it involves implementing so many things that we take for granted now. National food standards were introduced. A wide range of agricultural marketing boards that often set prices were abolished. The dairy industry was deregulated and milk prices fell. Retail trading hours were deregulated in most jurisdictions. That meant families no longer had to do their grocery shopping in a crowded, mad rush on Saturday morning before shops closed for the weekend. Liquor licensing rules were refocused on societal impacts. The list goes on and on and includes a myriad number of small reforms, such as the repeal of a New South Wales law that restricted the times when bread could be baked. It's hard to think of a part of Australia where bakers couldn't bake bread at particular times. It feels deeply foreign. It's kind of like Doctor Who, but with bread regulations rather than aliens. A second core impact of national competition policy involved major reforms to key markets. While the start of these reform processes predated national competition policy, they were incorporated into it in 1995. Energy markets had long been characterised by public monopolies that were state-based and highly bureaucratic. As part of national competition policy, a competitive national electricity market was established. And today our government's rewiring the nation plan continues that work, ensuring that intermittent renewables can offset each other to provide cheaper, more reliable energy. Barriers to the free trade of gas within and across state and territory boundaries were removed and third party access to gas pipelines facilitated. Retail energy markets were open to competition, enabling consumers, sometimes for the first time, to shop around for the best deals and lowest prices. A third component of the reforms was the restructuring of many government businesses so they operated more efficiently. While national competition policy didn't require privatisations, there were a number of major privatisations or part privatisations during the 1990s. They included Telstra, Qantas, the Commonwealth Bank, airports and rail businesses. While many privatisations had positive impacts, there were some unforeseen consequences, which I'll get to later. National competition policy also dealt with a range of less prominent but still important matters. Monopoly pricing was subject to greater scrutiny. Government businesses were to compete on a level playing field with their private competitors. And the competition law that Labor enacted in 1974 would now apply to all businesses across the economy. For example, lawyers, accountants and other professionals practising in partnerships would no longer be exempt. The Council of Australian Governments agreed to establish the National Competition Council to oversee progress on implementation of these reforms. 
Importantly, the Commonwealth agreed to make payments to the states and territories, conditional on the implementation of competition reforms. In the end, the, competition, the Commonwealth paid around $5.7 billion in competition payments to states and territories by 2005. So how did it affect the economy? Australia's productivity performance in the 1990s has been described as exceptional by Dean Parham. Labor productivity grew at over 3% a year, driving rapid growth in GDP and, most importantly, in living standards. This performance persisted through the 1997 Asian financial crisis. Australia's productivity performance in the 1990s was one of the best in the advanced world and saw Australia move up the international ranking on, um, on average incomes. Now, there were many factors behind this productivity growth. Partly, it reflected the impact of computerisation. Partly, too, the economy was benefiting for a better, from a better educated workforce. But national competition policy reforms were clearly a critical factor behind the 1990s productivity surge. In its 2005 review of the impact of the national competition policy reforms, the Productivity Commission analysed the impact on the economy. That analysis estimated a permanent increase of 2.5% in Australia's GDP from competition reform. Today, that lift equates to around $50 billion a year, or around $5,000 per household. And it's worth thinking about that $50 billion a year annual cost when we think about the fact that the incentive payments to the states were a one-off payment of around $5 billion. Moreover, the Productivity Commission thought that its estimate of the benefit to the economy was conservative because it didn't capture the dynamic efficiency gains of more competitive markets. Given the limitations of its modelling, the report concluded the total boost to GDP for the reforms was likely to be considerably larger than that. While the economic impacts of national competition policy were substantial, the reforms also transformed the zeitgeist of the nation. They are a reminder that at our best, Australia has been a world leader in social policy, tariff liberalisation, income contingent loans and more. In those years, no country on the planet moved further and faster than Australia to implement competition reform and boost living standards. So, on the 30th anniversary of the Hilma reforms, what lessons can today's competition reformers take from them? Drawing on my own reading of history and aided by Professor Hilmer's own reflections, I believe there's seven lessons for those of us seeking to improve the dynamism of the Australian economy today. Number one, paint on a big canvas. National competition policy was a big, bold and far-reaching package of reforms. It had the attention of a Prime Minister who then got the attention of the nation. The Hilmer Review provided the intellectual firepower, the raw material that Prime Minister Keating turned into vision and that rapidly deglazed eyes across the press gallery. It enabled the views of key interest groups to be heard and taken into account. Not everyone will love the idea of a more competitive economy. Rod Sims liked to say that Competition policy is minus one times corporate strategy. Sims often points to corporate strategy guru Michael Porter, who demonstrated that firms can attain commercial success by reducing competition, erecting high entry barriers, keeping suppliers dispersed and weak, creating strong consumer loyalty, and reducing the likelihood of other firms being able to offer your consumers products that they see as sub substitutable for your product. If you're going to challenge Michael Porter and parts of the corporate strategy world, you need a really clear story about why more dynamism and more competition will make most people better off.
Lesson two, money talks. There's always more good ideas jostling for attention than there is time to implement them. The state and territory treasuries seeking to grab the attention of other parts of government, it helps if they can say that there's money on the line. The prospect of receiving substantial competition payments was clearly a factor driving states and territories to persevere with difficult reforms. Lesson three, you can only invent the hill's hoist once. Maintaining competition in Australia is a dynamic rather than a static exercise. The Hilmer and national competition policy reforms were well suited to the challenges Australia faced in the early 1990s, such as the need to reform government businesses. But in the 2020s, we face new challenges. The focus of competition reform in our era should be on the private sector, where there's real concerns about Australia's economic dynamism. Emerging trends, such as the fall in job switching and business startup rates, just as market concentration and markups increase, suggest our economy has become less competitive. Almost 30 years later, many industries have changed beyond recognition. Digital platforms pose competition policy challenges that weren't conceived of in the early 1990s. Lesson four, look after the poorest. National competition policy touched virtually every community, every business, and every consumer. While the reforms left people better off, at least overall, it wasn't the case for everyone. For example, there's little doubt that the economic reforms contributed to the challenges facing some rural communities. There was some criticism that the Hilmer Review and the Council of Australian Governments should have focused more on how to better manage the impact of competition reform on communities likely to be worst affected. Today, we've got better microdata than ever, allowing more precise modelling of the likely impact of reforms on different groups in the population. We should use it to ensure that reforms benefit the most disadvantaged. A more dynamic economy must not leave people behind. Lesson five, keep it green. 30 years ago, the focus was squarely on improving economic efficiency. Today, however, reforms to improve competition must also help protect and promote the environment. Energy markets are an obvious example. It'll be important to promote competition as they transition to a low emissions future. Australians want cheaper, cleaner energy, not one or the other. As we transition to zero net carbon emissions, we'll need to adapt our buildings, transport networks, manufacturing facilities and more. Competition policy should encourage this transition and the many new jobs that will accompany it. Lesson six, privatised monopolies can be dangerous. The Hilmer Review highlighted a danger that could arise when public monopolies were privatised. The mark of success of a privatisation is more than just the sale price. If a privatisation closes off competition or fails to regulate the prices that can be charged to users, then a deal that can seem savvy in the short term looks pretty foolish in the long term, amounting to a multi-decade tax on consumers and exporters. If the aim of the game was just to make money now, then anyone who owns a house could boost their bank balance by selling their home to investors, who then rent your home back to you. The fact that most of us would think this is a pretty bad idea should make us reflect for a moment when we weigh the costs and benefits of privatising government assets. It'd be worthwhile for state, territory and federal governments to develop a better process for scrutinising potential privatisations through a competition lens. Because everyone agrees that it's not much good for taxpayers to get a hefty price from a privatisation only to be price gouged by the newly formed private sector monopoly. Lesson seven, federalism can drive reform. National competition policy 
could never have happened without Commonwealth, state and territory governments working cooperatively toward a common goal over a number of years. Through the Council of Australian Governments, these conversations happened on a regular tempo, both between ministers and officials. The fact that the Council of Australian Governments was the right vehicle then doesn't mean it's the only vehicle to drive reform today. Today it could be done through the Council on Federal Financial Relations or some other body. But because of the nature of reforms required and the way that competition policy straddles jurisdictions, federalism and competition policy will always be intertwined. So to close, the Australian economy today needs a good dose of competition. Compared with the 2000s, rates of start-up business formation and job switching are down. Market concentration and markups are up. Productivity growth, exceptional in the 1990s, was sluggish in the 2010s. Like most reform challenges, it's easier to outline the problem than craft a solution. That's why I've focused today on what we can learn from the biggest wave of Australian competition reforms in the past half century, the Hilmer Review and National Competition Policy. 30 years on, there's seven lessons from those reforms. Tell a big story. Deploy financial incentives for reform where possible. Solve the next problem, not the last one. Protect vulnerable communities. Promote changes that improve both economic dynamism and environmental sustainability. Beware of privatised monopolies. Use federalism to drive reform. Microeconomic reform requires cooperation and an alignment of incentives. It also requires conversations about our vision for the nation. The national competition policy reforms of the 1990s improved the lives of Australians. A new wave of competition reforms will deliver better prices and more consumer choices. It'll help improve living standards of Australian households by increasing access to the latest technologies. It'll also help Australia maintain the international competitiveness of its industries. This especially matters for service industries, which often rely on digital competition. Australia has benefited from the Hilmer reforms in many ways. Even the lower bound estimate suggests the typical Australian household is thousands of dollars a year better off than if the reforms had not been undertaken. It's a remarkable achievement, and we should continue to learn as much as we can. After all, the problems facing the Australian economy today are just as acute as in 1992. We desperately need competition reform. Many of those issues are at a state and territory level. Problematic privatisations, restrictive zoning laws that impede new start-ups, state housing taxes that make it expensive for people to move to take up a better job, occupational licensing rules that make it harder for start-ups and job switches, energy markets that don't work as well as they should, one of the central insights from economics is that competitive markets generally serve consumers better than private monopolies. Today, competition provides an organising framework for tackling some of the biggest challenges facing households and the macro economy. In Australia, competition isn't purely a national issue. It's a compact between states, territories and the federal government. We need to work together to get it right. If competition policy could lay this groundwork for another 1990s type productivity surge, the result would be more innovation and more startups, more opportunities for workers and more choice for consumers, better use of technology and household budgets that stretch a little further. In short, a zippier economy. Thanks very much. <laughs>
Thanks, Andrew. So there you have it. In seven easy steps, we've got a zippier economy and we get to take on the legacy um, that Professor Hilmer gave us 30 years ago. So thanks so much for joining us on that and um, outlining those ideas to us. We've got some questions um, from the audience, but can I just um, start with one question related to your, um, your, the last point there. You talked about um, the need for the cooperative federalism to achieve these kinds of reforms. And I noticed your comments in the Sydney Morning Herald today and I wondered whether the political environment is right for this kind of ambition, given that politics is probably more divided than it once was, than it was 30 years ago. Things are more combative. Do you think it's possible to do all of the things that you've just outlined, or is the political to, are those political times beyond us? Or? So, as I was in the, uh, the, the car coming here, I was reading the transcript of the press conference that Anthony Albanese and Don Perrottet did this morning. And it started off with Michael McCormack introducing Anthony Albanese, saying nice things about him, Anthony saying nice things about Michael and about Dom, uh, and then well, one of the uh, state MPs introducing Dom, and there was a sense of shared purpose around that. And that's it's something that we just take for granted in the context of a, uh, of a natural disaster. Mm -hmm. And you know, they're, they're there working on floods. I think Australians would have been shocked if they'd been you know, snarking at one another in that context. But the fact that those leaders are able to do so in a, in a quite combative in political environment for Dom Perrottet, mm -hmm. he's, uh, he's behind in the polls at the moment, facing an election next year, but still stepping above party politics today, uh, does make me think that we can, we can achieve it and it shouldn't, it shouldn't be beyond us to have that sort of uh, conversation. Uh, the Jobs and Skills Summit had, mm -hmm. uh, had a bit of that flavour. And a lot of this stuff person need not be terribly ideological. Mm. Uh, you know, I think we can all agree that allowing bakers to start baking bread at whatever time <laughs> they want to uh, is a good idea. And, and I, I might make an argument for that uh, around this being important for low-income uh, bakers to make more money. Um, someone, one of my Liberal colleagues might say this is all about the freedom of business owners. Mm. But we can agree on the outcome. Terrific, yeah. thank you. Love a bit of ambition in a federal minister. It's good to see. Um, just to say, we've got some questions from uh, pre-submitted, but if anybody in the audience would like to ask a question, I'll come to you in just a moment. But that answer gives us a great opportunity to segue into one submitted by Felix earlier, which is, it was about how, how this can be done, but in particular, what sectors require particular attention from a competition perspective? I assume the bread baking's sorted. What's next? <laughs> uh, well, I've, I've talked before mm. about uh, uh, some of the challenges we've had around uh, privatisations, and mm. I think being aware of uh, the risks of getting privatisation wrong is important. So if states and territories are looking at potential privatisations, having a better process for scrutinising that matters. Uh, and then there's, there's also all of the zoning and licensing issues mm. which cut across uh, a, a whole, whole range of sectors. Uh, if you're trying to start up a business, having a little bit more flexi flexibility there is, uh, is important. Mm -hmm. And for areas like hardware, you know, ultimately whether uh, a large big box hardware store comes to, hardware chain comes to drive out all of the local hardware stores will turn often uh, not on overall competition rules but how the zoning laws operate at a local mm -hmm. level. Terrific. Thank you. Um, you did talk a little bit about this um, in, your, uh, in your formal speech, but Chris has asked a question about how do you break the government economic growth mantra that drives unsustainable population, social environment and resource consumption? I think it was point four that you talked about how we need to do it in a green way as well. Yeah. Does that yeah. mean you don't see it as either or? You think we can do both? No, I mean, Australia is 80% services, so uh, much of our production is not the... Uh, production of things that will break your foot if you drop on them. Uh, when mm. we, uh, you become more productive in your job, uh, that doesn't necessarily use more stuff. Mm. Uh, so improving the productivity of a services-driven economy uh, oughtn't increase our footprint on the planet. Uh, and in fact, if you look at the fact, if you look at the trend in Sydney over the last uh, couple, of, couple of generations, uh, this is a city which is. Uh, has many more people, uh, has, is producing much more stuff, and where the air quality is vastly better than it was uh, uh, 50 years ago. So we've managed with the issue of air quality to pack a whole lot more people in with a whole lot more economic output, uh, but a cleaner, a cleaner city. And, and my hope is we can do that with CO2 emissions as well.
Sounds great. Speaking of uh, services industries, there's a question here about universities, so I might move to that if I may. Um, Danik has asked a question about in what ways do you think Australian universities can best contribute to increase competition and a competitive startup market? What's your uh, mantra for us? Well, uh, so I think uh, offering products which are more different is important. Um, I was really struck, you know, it's what, a bit over a decade ago now when Melbourne decided it would offer a four-year undergraduate degree and people said this is outrageous. Um, it was at the time probably the first example of undergrad innovation that we'd seen in decades. Uh, even if you thought it was a bad idea, my view was you should be cheering on Melbourne for trying something different. Uh, we don't need 40 universities that are clones of one another. I'd love to see a little bit more diverse, diversity mm -hmm. and, and trying new models. I've always found it strange that there's not uh, Australian universities pursuing more of the kind of uh, Dartmouth-Brown liberal arts style college in Australia, focusing on super high quality teaching uh, as their differentiator rather than cutting edge research. Uh, and so, you know, why a university like the University of New, Engl New England doesn't pursue that model, I'm mm -hmm. not quite sure. Uh, so, uh, so trying to produce stuff that is different, mm. I think, is, uh, is what I'd love to see more of in higher ed. Sounds great. Do you think there's more we could do in the, in the startup market? I know we certainly have ambition to do more there. Do you think there's a role that universities can be doing to do, do a few more inventions? Love to see it. <laughs> so you, you walk around the campuses of uh, MIT and Stanford and you just mm -hmm. stumble across a whole lot of startup spin-off mm. businesses. You walk around a campus of, uh, uh, let's see, should be careful here, uh, <laughs> university... Don't need to name anywhere. Exactly, a major Australian <laughs> university. And you come across a whole range of lovely cafes and bars. Mm. Uh, but the, you don't tend to see those co-located mm -hmm. startup businesses operating in the same way. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's because of the rules around IP. People occasionally mm -hmm. argue that there's an attempt to keep too much of the mm -hmm. IP. Uh, maybe it's because we're not inculcating that, that startup culture. Mm -hmm. I don't want every academic to be turned into a business person, but I'd love to see uh, graduates encouraged mm -hmm. to stay in close proximity. Uh, you look at the OECD data about the extent to which businesses collaborate with universities, and we are way down the list. Mm -hmm. um, Kim Carr used to argue that you want some premium in the R&D tax credit mm -hmm. for firms that do university collaboration mm -hmm. in, in, in some way, just to, just to start that conversation, which we know can often be really productive for firms. Certainly a conversation I know we welcome, and my uh, colleagues in the research portfolio just um, would, be, would be cross with me if I didn't say we've had 35 startups here at the university in the last five years. Nice. Nine Very in good. 2019, the year before COVID hit, more than the CSIRO. So Great. we're quite proud of that, but that doesn't mean we don't think there's more we can be doing. Yeah. So um, welcome that kind of conversation, I think. Are there any questions in the... Oh, there are lots. Um, Professor Horn, Julia Horn, do you want to stand up? We'll come to everybody, I think. But... So thank you very much. Oh, okay. yeah. So thank you very much, and you know, welcome to the University of Sydney. Um, so I was really pleased, actually. I think it was point number three, where you talk about uh, vulnerable communities and how what works competitively. I think you know your example was metropolitan versus rural. So there are adjustments there. So I wondered if you could just unpack that a bit more. And thinking in particular, you know, of um, social, um, so uh, what's it called? Anyway, you know, small startup businesses which are social enterprises. Um, and how is that one way um, that perhaps disadvantage can not be forgotten here and vulnerable communities treated, uh, uh, you know, um, so that they're not vulnerable anymore. Anyway, so I'd like to hear more on that, please. <laughs> Terrific. Uh, th thank you, Julia. I think that's a, a great area to, uh, to delve into. Yeah, we, most of us don't think of ourselves through the lens of what we consume, but through the lens of what we produce. And so uh, if someone's capacity to produce is taken away by a set of reforms, then the fact that everything on the supermarket shelf is a little cheaper uh, doesn't, ta doesn't make up for, that, for it. Um, so we do need to ensure that there's appropriate transition plans and one of the uh, real skills of the Hawke-Keating trade liberalisation changes was the steel plan, uh, the, uh, the TCF plan that accompanied those, uh, those changes to, to try and mitigate the impacts on the, the workers who were affected. 
in terms of competition reform, uh, you want to be thinking about how, the, how structural adjustment would affect those particular firms. And, and I agree, you might well be looking at uh, co-op, mutual, or uh, philanthropy-funded alternatives. Uh, you think about the Australian Centre for Rural, Rural Entre Entrepreneurship that's been set up, ACRE, which is operating out of the old Beechworth Jail, uh, and uh, those, those sorts of initiatives which have sprung up to try and fill a niche and provide opportunities to build entrepreneurship in rural communities, I think have been fabulous. A uh, lot of really good philanthropic funded stuff. Uh, uh, I, uh, I often try and emphasise that having the portfolios of charity and competition uh, are not in contradiction, but often you can see those things working very nicely together. Now, I should say, Kirsten, I don't know if Professor Hilmer yes. wanted to make any comment uh, at any point, but I would love, it, love any reflec reflections you, ha you, you had on it, on, the, uh, on, on how you feel 30 years on. Thanks. <coughs> Thanks, Andrew. My first comment is I think you did a great job, and I think you reminded us of the benefits that competition brought, and you reminded us about how difficult it is and what sort of commitment you need from all the areas of government to get a reform like that on the, underway. Um, the other comment is 30 years out of date, but what were the big areas then? And I don't think that's changed that much. Okay. The big area 30 years ago was energy. Well, it's energy plus now. <laughs> the second biggest was transport and the dimensions of that and the way in which um, we might address that through technology, electric cars, hydrogen, whatever, uh, has, that's changed, but the need to get transport on a far more pro productive footing, I think, is as acute now as it was 30 years ago. The other, the other part of the work that we did then that I think was important, but it doesn't appear in the report, is that we tried to put examples in front of people that just showed how competition wasn't going to make life worse, it would make life better. And uh, one that um, I got a lot of mileage out of was sort of the quiz, where do you think the potato chips in McDonald's restaurants through Asia, uh, where do those Asian restaurants get their potatoes? And the answer was not Tasmania, it was not West Australia, the answer was Idaho. And well, why Idaho? And you got down to, well, look how big our farms are. There's not one in the, in the small farm you simply couldn't afford the, the uh, water treatment mm. uh, and, and the irrigation and the technology of controlling output more, more effectively. And so what happened was we had no industry where we had a huge national advantage. Uh, and the only reason we didn't have the advantage was these silly rules. And we kept reminding people about that. Are you supporting that? And I think that that gave a little bit of a human face yeah. to you know people who, when they're called economists, know it's deep down a bad word. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And thanks again for being here today. Opportunity to be here with somebody, the architect of these reforms. I think you'll agree with me that uh, Andrew shared the, in some detail the contribution and ways in which we're all benefiting yes. um, from your reforms. So thank you for that. Not only have you led a, uh, made so many contributions to public life, led a substantial a university, of course, but um, in so many different ways. So to go through that today has been terrific. Um, we've got a question. We had there were quite a few. There was one at the back here. Sorry, yeah, sorry. We can. I'm just trying. Can you just put can people just put their hands up if they've got a question, so I can try to make sure we get to them. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, it's on. It's on. Hello. Hello. Here we go. Um, I'd also like to add my thanks to Mr. Hilmer for all his wonderful contributions over the years. Um, and I also uh, think that uh, one of the ways that universities uh, uh, need to be helped is to uh, re-employ the 40,000 uh, people who were sacked because they didn't get the JobKeeper allowance, another genius decision of the previous government. Um, yeah, uh, one thing I would add that I think gets missed out on, never gets, seems to get talked about, and this uh, was brought to mind by a report that the Australia Institute released in June of this year, which is about foreign ownership, uh, because uh, 
it pointed out that foreign ownership in Australia is much, much higher, not only that people perceive, that even people in policy areas perceive, like it opens with the uh, statement that our LNG assets, which are very much in the news, were, uh, if you count the corporate and also overseas private share ownership, 95% foreign owned. So all that revenue is going overseas, but the point also is that there's, they had, don't have a vested interest in seeing us you know, worry about our gas supplies here because they're all only interested in making money. So this is, I think, the step eight that you might want to add to your plan, is how to integrate this idea of, I would suggest, finding a way to buy back the farm, possibly with our future fund. Um, Norway, for example, taxes uh, their fossil fuel assets at 78%. They're high wage country, a uh, high cost country, but they can still manage to arm twist the uh, fossil fuel producers to cough up 78% and we know the situation with Alan Carpenter who was in Australia who did the same thing to get his 15% reserve. Sorry, which is, is that the question? Sorry, yep. I just, there's a little, 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 little background there. But the point I'm trying to make is a lot of decisions are made overseas, corporate decision making, because of that process mm -hmm. and people <coughs> don't realise how much of that there is. So I think in terms of competition policy, it will, uh, we will kind of be stymied by the fact that there will be forces overseas that won't want to see these competition reforms because they're getting a very good earn out of it. So I'm just wondering, have you thought about this as a, uh, uh, another arm of uh, policy that you might want to develop, uh, as I say, to find a way to maybe try to buy back the farm and bring back decision making to us here and then we can really get competition going properly? Uh, thank you very much. I think it's, uh, it's, it's one of those issues where uh, economists tend to, to be somewhat at odds with the uh, uh, mainstream public opinion. Uh, economists tend to like more investment and be fairly relaxed about whether that in additional investment comes domestically or overseas. Uh, last time I crunched the numbers, there was about $1.09 of uh, Australian investment was coming in from overseas which means that if you cut off foreign investment in entirely, just to take the very extreme case, then you'd have one in nine projects wouldn't go ahead, one in nine buildings wouldn't get built, one in nine light rail projects wouldn't go ahead, and one in nine factories wouldn't get built, and so on. Um, and occasionally that foreign investment comes with a useful know-how as well. So, you know, think about Schweppes coming in with its bottling plants or the Japanese investment in beef farms, uh, the uh, US investment in car manufacturing. That's brought uh, know-how that wasn't here locally. Uh, but you need a set of rules around that which ensure that people pay their taxes, uh, that they're complying with local labour market requirements and that they're putting back into the community because those owners won't necessarily have interests which are as aligned with the, with the local community. Um, so there's certainly a, a risk that if people see foreign ownership as synonymous with not paying your taxes, uh, then public opinion is going to turn sourly against it. Terrific, thank you. One from the lady in the black top. Sorry, I don't know your name. Thanks, Dr Lee, for your insights and your um, uh, contribution uh, today. Um, my question really is around, do you think um, market failures are inevitable? We, we've had the, the excellent Hilma report. 20 or so years later, we also saw the Harmer uh, review. I think it was about 2015. Mm. Um, with additional recommendations. Why then do we continue to uh, hear the likes of the former chairman of the ACCC talk about market failures and what we need to be doing differently to ensure that we're not seeing market concentration and to enable greater participation by women? Thank you. Yeah, it's a great, a great question. I think partly the reason that competition policy isn't a once and done issue is that technology changes. So the issues we're facing with uh, the rise of Amazon, for example, a, a platform service which uh, looks a little bit more like a railroad than a corner store, uh, raises a set of issues as to uh, its, its dominance uh, in, the, uh, in, in, the, in the retail space and potentially necessitates additional rules around that. Uh, likewise with the rise of Google in search and uh, the rise of Facebook and social media. And partly also there has been disagreement among economists which has flowed through to the way in which competition laws are written and enforced uh, as to the extent that you should worry about concentration per se. 
there was a so-called Chicago School approach which said, well, big is beautiful. There's big economies of scale and we shouldn't worry so long as those uh, big monopolies uh, don't appear to be driving up prices in the short term. And I think the economics community has moved back against that, in including some at the University of Chicago itself. Um, but that's taking a while to flow through to laws and the way those laws are ad administered. Thank you. Um, I might take that opportunity to ask a question from Luigi as well, sure. uh, who's asked, submitted this question from home, which is, what steps are you taking to empower the ACCC to seek to disgorge profits from the owners of medical-related patents that are held by an Australian court to be invalid? Uh, we haven't done anything on that specific issue. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for submitting the question, Luigi. Thought it important to ask. Now, I had a question over here. Andrew, Dale Bailey, Faculty of Medicine and Health here, and I come at this as a physicist, so I know nothing about economics, but why doesn't it feel like there's a lot of competition to me? Why do I feel like Colesworth dominate the farm gate price? Qantas can wipe Virgin out tomorrow if they wanted to. Uh, the banks always pass on the interest rate rises. Why do we need a rethink? Do we need a reimagining, to use one of your earlier book titles words? Uh, Dale, I think you're right. I mean, uh, it was John Daly, the former head of the Grattan Institute, who said to me, uh, try the following game. Sit down with a bunch of friends and see how many industries you can name uh, in Australia that are not dominated by a handful of players. Uh, and it's, uh, it's not a very long game. Uh, there's, uh, you know, you think about, it's not just banks and supermarkets, it's baby food and beer. Uh, there's a range of sectors in Australia which are highly concentrated. In the United States, the... Uh, pro-competition people will sometimes say it starts with baby food and ends with coffins. Um, so, <coughs> he says coffin. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and so I think there, there does need to be a rethink of the extent to which competition matters and the extent to which uncompetitive markets have been a problem. And that's part of the reason that I'm uh, giving today's talk, to try and raise that awareness and to, to think about whether there's more we need to do. Thank you. I think, did you have a question, <coughs> sir? Yep. Sorry, can we get the... We'll just get a microphone to you. Thank you. A Andrew, you've written a recent <coughs> book on sport, and uh, as you'll be the first to uh, argue, I'm sure, uh, sport involves both competition and mm. cooperation. Indeed, it's that delicious combination that makes team sports in particular so interesting and engaging. Um, do you think there's a danger that putting the emphasis primarily on competition rather than on cooperation takes you down a narrower market road than is good for society as a whole? Specifically, problems of market failure, problems of over-reliance on consumer choice, where consumers are often simply not equipped to make complex choices between different electricity companies, packages, and so on. And perhaps most fundamentally, where there's a risk shift uh, to households uh, <coughs> associated in part with growing mm. social inequality, mm. which the economic statistics, as you know better than most, uh, show occurred over the very period you're talking about as a success story for competition policy. The record is surely more mixed, is it not? Yeah, great question, Frank. So uh, I think if, if there's markets where you can uh, observe the characteristics of the products you're, products you're buying reasonably well, then market competition probably gets us most of the way. So if you're buying a new car, uh, I'm reasonably confident you're going to do your homework and what we need to do is ensure that you have lots of choices and it's pretty easy to, to move between dealers and see what you've got. If you're choosing a superannuation plan, I think the idea we had in the early 90s is that competition would solve it. You know, you'd, you'd choose your super fund, you'd choose the plan within it, and you'd, you'd optimise. But we know now, 30 years on, pretty much no one does that. People just sit in the default plan and the default fund. So we've got to improve defaults in that industry. So <coughs> I think it depends on the complexity. It depends on the extent to which uh, ordinary consumers can grasp what's going on. Uh, and if they can't, then we need to improve defaults. And if they can, we need to improve competition. Thank you. We've got time for one last question. Did, sorry. Back to this lady. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, my question would be, um, what do you think is the role for other policies, um, national policies, in order to support <coughs> industrial or competition policy? For example, um, what is the role for industrial relations if you know, firms face more competitions domestically and internationally? They're competing not just for domestic talent, but overseas talent. Um, you know, uh, how would business, uh, how, sorry, um, yeah. Or education, for example, um, we want more competitions in the economy, but we're cutting funding to university and vocational training. So, where would the talents come from to compete internationally? Um, or, um, yeah, that's maybe a question. Yeah, no. I, so, I think the the employer employee side of this is probably the least researched area, and one I'm quite keen to uh, explore next year. Uh, if you have concentrated markets, we've typically worried that you'll gouge your consumers. Increasingly now, I think there's a recognition that you might also underpay your workers because as employees, all of us rely on the ability to switch jobs in order to get a better deal. Uh, and if this was a uh, city with only one university and Kirsten was unable to move cities because of household reasons or because of the housing market was messy, then she would earn less than to work in a city with multiple universities, where if Sydney University decides to mistreat, mistreat Kirsten, then there are other potential employ, em, employers out there. And so as market concentration has increased, more and more Australian workers have found themselves in a situation where they've got less and less choice of employers. Uh, and that may well be one of the reasons that we've seen the, the lousy wage growth of the, uh, the past decade. I'm sorry, is it a quick question? We've got to finish at 3.30. Sorry, can you just wait for us to get... So the folks at home don't miss out on your question. Thank you. Sorry, it was actually just a small bit of follow-up on that because um, can too much competition not also gouge the worker where we've seen in places in things like aged care where you're having um, a few hours in very, across very many different employers and it's caused um, complete dysfunction in that industry. Um, so I guess the question is can you have too much competition as well as too much concentration? Yeah, I think in that, in that instance it is about uh, uh, certainly strong mandated minimums and one of the things that we've done is to make a submission to Fair Work Australia on behalf of aged care workers calling for the, the appropriate minimum to be raised, which means that uh, while, you, while you can have competition between employers, uh, you can't have a race to the bottom uh, in which aged care workers simply aren't able to support a family on the wage that they're earning in that job. Um, thank you for such a wonderful Sorry. range of questions. I hadn't expected <laughs> such a, an interesting and wide-ranging wide conversation. So, so thank you. Well, really you clearly, appreciate clearly it. started it with your speech, mm -hmm. and I think that um, uh, you'll all agree with me that uh, uh, the University of Sydney likes to say that we we're, that our staff, students, and alumni represent leadership for good. And I think that if you look at the way that Andrew addresses complex public policy questions, looking at evidence thinking widely, taking a wide range of deep and complex questions, but looking at ways that uh, through either simple or complex reforms challenges ways to make the lives of Australians better. And I think that we can say that if all of our staff, students and alumni approached it with the same energy and intellect that you do, then the world will be a better place and certainly Australia will be better off. But we're grateful that you've chosen the University of Sydney to um, host this conversation today. I'm grateful to the people who submitted questions online or who have attended in person joining us. Um, the podcast and the video will be on demand on the Sydney Ideas and University of Sydney website. So will you join me in thanking uh, uh, Andrew Lee for joining us here today and thank you for coming. Thank you, Dustin. There's a lot of questions here for you. That's great. <laughs>